Thank you so much, Evan. And I want to go now to the former federal prosecutor and Rick Gates, former lawyer. He, of course, could be the star in all of this, right? Uh, the former deputy of Manafort who has turned against him, that's Shan Wu. And White House correspondent for American Urban Radio Network's April Ryan, political editor for The New York Times, Patrick Healy, is here with me. So let me start with you, Patrick. Manafort was broke when he went to work for Trump for free in 2016. Maybe he thought that would, you know, all of a sudden, hey, you're back at the top of the U.S. political world. That's going to help me get jobs overseas and fix my whole debacle. But how surprising is this? I mean, broke when we're hearing about 60 million bucks from just one country? Right. I mean, this is a breed of kind of American business oligarchs. I mean, they are wheeler and dealers. They're looking for sort of big strikes, big deals. But particularly the political consultant game it can be, there can be very big paydays, as we know from overseas, and it's clear that Paul Manafort saw a lot of money to be gained in places like Ukraine and sort of, you know, desperate characters and actors who were trying to get in who had access to a lot of money. And frankly, he also saw that in Donald Trump. I mean, this notion of like, this guy is, is about to win, it looks like, the Republican nomination. He is loving this kind of attention. He's loving the train that he's on. You know, how much money can I make from him? You know, it's it is it is part of the American political consultant class about these sort of paydays and it's just it's really surprising. And, and you know, April, you know, again, this this issue of being broke. I mean, compared to what we heard today from the bookkeeper and some of the, the landscapers and others who testified about Manafort spending. I want to show everyone a picture because I love these pictures. This is Manafort's house in the Hamptons. This is not the house of a broke man. Uh, $450,000 on landscaping. And then he shaped a flower bed in the shape of an M. Very humble man. And then a pond, which he called one of the biggest ponds in the Hamptons. $2.2 million, April, for Apple TVs and other electronics, including $10,000 for a karaoke system. I mean... It's just stunning. Mm -hmm. I, I just have to say, because it just gives a perspective of how this person thought and how this person spent money. He's spending money like this, and then mm -hmm. he's broke. I mean, literally broke, like in the hole by millions of dollars? In the hole, Aaron. In the hole. He made it rain. I mean, this is a whole... I mean, he actually made it rain with the $60 million, and it came from basically from the Ukraine with connections to Russia. Now, here's the thing. Um, we can't fathom, a lot of us cannot fathom this because, you know, a lot of people have to deal with paying for college education. I mean, if you put two of the jackets together, the python and the ostrich leather, you could possibly put a down payment on um, an Ivy League uh, college education for one year. You know, think yeah. of that. I mean, he lived in a lifestyle that many of us would not understand. I mean, he was spending $1,200 on suits, one suit, $1,200. And then when you think about that suit, and I hate to get in the minutia of this, but when you deal with the pocket square, if you get a $1,200 suit, you got to get a pocket square that's commensurate to the price of the suit and a shirt. He was spending money hand over fist, and for him to be broke like that, it, according to what they say in 2016, he yeah. was trying to come back. He was trying to make a financial comeback by doing it for free, because he was hanging in circles with people who had the money, who did right. make it rain. He lost his, but right. he was trying to get it back. Right, it almost would have looked like, uh, you know, I That's guess crazy. in his view, maybe pathetic to say you want to get whatever the money for a campaign manager would be when you're ostensibly worth this right. massive amount of money. I mean, Shanda right. Landscaper, right. and this is, I want to see how important you think this may be legally, said that, you know, there was a bill that was presented, right, that supposedly he gave to Manafort, right? He, the landscaper, said, no, I never did. And he called it a, quote, fake invoice. He said the vendor name was wrong. The address had errors in it. A home improvement vendor also said the same thing. Uh, that, that, that something that he had, you know, Manafort, had been presented to Manafort was not from him, had the wrong name and address. What could be the significance of these fake invoices, which, by the way, totaled in hundreds of thousands of dollars apiece? Yeah, that's a very fascinating piece of evidence that's starting to come in, <clears throat> and we don't know exactly how the prosecutors are going to end up tying that up yet. They're mm. simply laying the foundation. But certainly it sounds like from what we heard in court today, that this is for merchandise and the services possibly never received. So that certainly could be an important building block towards the notion that he was hiding money, that he actually got money um, and he wanted to make it look like he was yeah. spending it, but actually he was just holding on to it. All right, so Shan, you know Rick Gates, right? I mean, because you, you were his former lawyer, so you know him well. And he's obviously center to all of this. You know, obviously today we heard from more people all saying Manafort and Manafort alone was the one they dealt with, the one who dealt the wires, the one who did everything, right? Never heard any mention of Rick Gates. Um, and now, you know, as, as, of course, Manafort's trying to say Rick Gates is the orchestrator of all this, so don't blame me, blame him. Rick Gates may testify tomorrow. 
and, and hit the stand, all right? You know him. How important is his testimony going to be? Yeah, I have to say anything I talk about, of course, is not violating or based on attorney-client confidences. Yeah. But I think that Rick is uh, ex extremely important uh, to the case, and it's a very bold move by the defense to put all their eggs in one basket and blame him for everything. And it's very clever in the sense that he, as an operational person, is going to be at the center of everything. So it allows the defense to mount a mm -hmm. broad attack against all of the government's case just by focusing it on him. So I think it's going to be critical. Downside to that, of course, put all your eggs in one basket, something happens to the basket. For example, if yeah. Rick comes across very well on the stand, um, that's going to be very devastating for them. Well, let's just say if the glove doesn't fit, that's, that's right. right. There can be a big issue. I, right. and, and most people know to right. what I am referring.